Salute everyone, I'm Carla Hurt and this is the talk that I presented at the Classics Association Victoria Conference in March 2022. It's still the same day as the day that I presented this. I'm going to be talking about spoken Latin in the classroom. My title was Latin at the Speed of Speech, uh, but I want to dispel some fears that people might have. A CI-based Latin course does not mean uncritically copying practices from a modern language classroom. It doesn't mean role-playing ordering coffee and pizza in Latin as if that was the goal. Uh, it doesn't mean throwing learners in the deep end of immersion and seeing who sinks or swims. Like Immersion is not the same as comprehensible input. Uh, and it also doesn't mean exclusive use of Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina per se illustrata. I actually don't use Lingua Latina per se illustrata at the moment while I'm teaching year 7 to 12. A little bit about myself is I learnt Latin from the Cambridge Latin course in high school, in Melbourne Girls Grammar School. Uh, and I learnt Ancient Greek from a grammar textbook in university, in Melbourne University. I teach Latin in years 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and I started teaching about um, in 2017, so that makes this my sixth year of Latin teaching. Uh, I'd been teaching through a hybrid of grammar translation and the reading method for about four years, and then halfway through last year, I started learning Biblical Hebrew with Aleph with Beth, a comprehensible input-based approach, and I found it ten times more effective than learning the language with grammar translation, uh, and it changed my outlook so much that starting in about June last year, halfway through last year, I've been transforming my Latin teaching towards comprehensible input-based methods. Also, I've been learning Italian since December purely by the mass comprehensible input method, i.e. Netflix, and I recently started an ancient Greek club at my school, uh, an informal lunchtime club teaching students spoke in ancient Greek. The structure of this talk is I'm going to give a brief explanation of what comprehensible input kind of is, just enough to get you a feel for it and how it differs from a grammar translation framework. I don't want that to go higher than 15-ish minutes. I think on the day it actually went to 20 minutes. But uh, this isn't enough time to actually give a make a case for comprehensible input. This is more give you a taste for comprehensible input. Then I want to spend the bulk of my time on my bag of tricks. I'll split that to a second video because of upload lengths. And uh, then there was Q&A time and things like that, uh, which I won't record, I don't think. All right, into the talk. We have all had this experience as Latin teachers. There's a student who can't properly label or analyze grammar features, but is actually good at translating sentences. And then there's another student over in the other corner who is great at passing grammar tests and can use the terminology and all the names and can make it fit, but struggles to actually apply it in unseen translation. And then there's another student who gets 100% on vocab tests and can recite their principal parts on tests, but can't recognize principal parts in unseen and can't recognize vocab words in an unseen. Like, we've all been there. We've seen that. Um, I've been looking at the data that I had in my first four years of teaching. These were all pre-COVID years where um, trying to figure out how do I make unseen translation scores go up? And what I found was translation as a skill is something that stays pretty consistent over time. It takes a long time to budge. So um, I've plotted here unseen scores, the average unseen score from one year versus the average unseen score for that same student for the next year. And other than the student's way at the bottom, it is very consistent. Like you're going to have a pretty good chance of being about the same level at translation year on year on year. So how do I get it to improve? How do I get students to push upwards? Um, I was also looking at the data for all my other things that I was testing for and trying to see if any of them aligned well with translation. So like if students were good at this other thing, uh, were they also good at translation? And what I found was that pretty much everything else that I was testing for, so grammar analysis, vocab tests, 
um, English Latin translation, pronunciation uh, stuff, uh, pretty much everything didn't really correlate very well. It was all fuzzy, fuzzy correlation with translation ability. And one of the worst ones was grammar analysis. Like, this was a total sh uh, scattershot um, where grammar analysis scores, uh, if you plot them against the unseen scores in either the same year or in the next year, they just did not align very much. And that is the sort of data equivalent of saying there's a student that knows grammar really well but can't translate to save their life. And over there, there's a student that can translate really well but can't answer a grammar test to save their life. So what this implies to me is that grammar analysis and translation are not very related. Otherwise, we would see much more of a relationship between the two. Um, and almost everything else that was testing parts of the language was not very related to testing the whole language. Um, so what is it that's going to cause translation skill to go up? Because clearly there is something there that's keeping, that is keeping it consistent. Something is contributing to a student's ability to handle a tough translation well. And what I've been drawn to think is it's the whole language skill that drives unseen translations. Um, treating language as a whole long form means of communication. Uh, Latin is, at its core, a language. It's not a code, uh, something cooked up to be hard for the sake of being hard. It's a natural human language, and all the complexities that arise in Latin arise because of natural human language tendencies. It was spoken natively by the people who wrote the classical canon. Uh, it, is a it is a natural native language for, for people who made the texts that we're studying. And while natural languages are complex, even so, somehow our brains can handle natural languages unconsciously and at incredible speeds once we have gotten it, once we have acquired the language. It seems to be no problem for the language engine in our brain to work things out. Um, so I've been drawn to conclude that approaches based on second language acquisition research should be applicable to all human languages, including Latin, Ancient Greek, Biblical Hebrew, all the, uh, any, any natural human language should be acquirable by the same means. So I uh, just wanted to visualize, sorry, this is my laser pointer here, if that's been bugging you. Uh, I wanted to visualize what it looks like, what examples of some of these approaches, differing perspectives look like. But um, I'm going to give pictures of textbooks like that. But I want to make a point that a lot of Latin teachers in the US, especially, are not using a textbook. They're, they've got their own curriculum that they've developed, and it's not the same as using a textbook. Uh, and sometimes we lose sight of that. A textbook is not the same as a curriculum, and you don't actually have to have a textbook to deliver a curriculum. So um, in the grammar translation examples, Wheelock's Latin is, you know, the classic kind of thing. Of It has exercises, it has paradigms, it's got uh, isolated uses of the language, it has isolated fragments of quotes, that kind of thing. It all kinds of comes at you randomly um, in terms of not forming a meaningful, sustained unit very much. Uh, then there's the reading method, and the poster child is Cambridge Latin course, but it also includes Oxford Latin course, Eke Romani, Suburani, and Lingua Latina. I put Lingua Latina in the reading method, which is the method that straddles grammar translation and comprehensible input, because while CLC and Lingua Latina contain comprehensible input, yes, they contain lots of comprehensible input, they also are built upon the framework of grammar translation. They're built upon the idea of needing to deliver a grammar translation curriculum, basically a, a series of grammar goalposts to move through, and they use readings to achieve that. There are comprehensible input-based uh, materials that don't assume the grammar curriculum as an external construct. And some of these include the Forum textbook by the Polis Institute in Jerusalem, which is a TPR-based textbook 
that provides scripts and pictures of classroom objects, um, dialogues for you to uh, meaningfully interact with with your students in your classroom that you can easily adapt to your situation. Um, and that's actually based on the idea of com comprehensible input, large amounts of spoken Latin in the classroom. And then there's uh, also Latin novellas, which are, there are over a hundred of them, and they have about 2,000, 3,000 words of connected story in them. They shelter the vocabulary and not the grammar, so they'll give you uh, whatever grammar forms are necessary to make a point, but they'll say it using simple words. So um, I'll talk more about novellas later in the talk, but just wanted to put them in there as some people don't structure their courses for Latin around a textbook like Cambridge Latin course. Some people in the US structure their courses around providing large amounts of input, such as through novellas or through things that the teacher has made, and uh, and building from there the whole language skill. Over in this corner, I've put conversation manuals. They exist. These are conversation manuals that contain like real world, modern language, Latin, neo Latin type um, conversations with the goal for producing conversational proficiency. I don't use these in my seven to twelve classes because Latin conversation is not a curriculum goal for me. The curriculum goal is reading fluency uh, and conversation in the classroom can facilitate that, absolutely. But I'm not trying to push students to be um, ordering pizza in Latin kind of thing, uh, as fun as that would be. So I just put them on the side there just to show just because something is communicative doesn't mean it's the same as a conversational manual and uh, also like vice versa. There are things that exist that are conversational man manuals if you want to do that yourself. Uh, there is a difference in grammar translation and comprehensible input as a mindset and I want to talk about that now. So in grammar translation the assumption is that language is grammar plus vocabulary. You learn grammar rules, you slot in vocabulary, and then you're good to go. you got to learn and tick off every grammar topic. There's a kind of sense of completionism about that. Um, you need to start each grammar topic by learning its name and terminology to do with it. Uh, usually it involves memorizing a chant or table to do with endings or forms. So you start with forms, and then you do drills and exercises with isolated words or phrases. Drills and exercises that don't contain a meaningful interaction in the language. like Things like, I listen, you say, he hears. Something like that. Like It doesn't actually form a narrative in any way. It's just words for the sake of practicing a feature. And then the final step with that cycle is to use the explicit knowledge that you've gained to translate something meaningful. Like, the, you get to use it in a meaningful way at the very end, uh, at the end of this cycle of learning something. The implications of grammar translation are that uh, when you've gone through all the grammar, you've learnt Latin, you're done, you can, you can handle the, you're ready for the classical canon once you've finished X grammar textbook. When reading, students need to slow down and focus on consciously recalling rules for accuracy. That's one of those implications. Uh, also, there's the idea that's sort of sneakily emerging from this, which is reading and translation is reinforcement for rules that were really learnt from the grammar explanations and grammar exercises. Like, you learnt it, you made it secure with those exercises, and now you apply it for reinforcement. Um, or maybe you apply it so you can learn more vocabulary or something, but it's just reinforcement. The fastest way to get through Latin would be to focus on memorizing the grammar rules and the core vocabulary and to reduce the amount of story-based activities. It might have less reinforcement, but it would cover all the bases and be faster. And if you need to assign remedial work because a student has gone into difficulty, then what you would do is figure out what exact knowledge gaps they have and then assign grammar exercises that address their specific knowledge gaps. Then we have the reading methods psychology, which is actually kind of um, something that is trying to be comprehensible input, but often is not executed like that. 
the teacher handbooks for the Oxford Latin course and for the Cambridge Latin course generally have this advice. Read aloud the entire story in Latin and then ask questions about it, preferably in Latin. Like the Oxford Latin course handbook even says, read it as fast as your students can stand. As, as fast as your students can still understand and do it rapidly because if you read it too slowly, you will uh, it will produce boredom. Um, like that kind of advice is very common in these reading method teacher handbooks. But in my experience, it's been very rare for me to encounter a teacher. And like I'm speaking of my own experience as well, me being a teacher who taught this way, uh, who would actually go by uh, presenting the stories entirely orally to students. Um, usually what happens is we pre-teach the grammar of the chapter in English or using uh, example sentences, picture caption sentences, whatever, and then we assign the stories as translations, we correct those translations up in English, then we hurry on to the next chapter, maybe adding some cultural stuff in English. Essentially, we execute the reading method as grammar translation, but with longer translations. We resort to grammar translation principles for remedial work when we're making excess exercises when the class is struggling with something, we usually make it in the form of drill type exercises or um, isolated sentences, extra practice sentences type exercises. Um, and when stripping things down to make a COVID curriculum, I'm talking specifically about what I did a couple of years ago, what got cut was the volume of reading. Because in my mindset, it was reading is for reinforcement, grammar is the core of the curriculum. So what gets cut is reading, and what gets added is grammar. So, yeah, I've been watering down the reading method to be more and more grammar translation-like. Then there's comprehensible input. Um, this video I will link in the description because I don't want to play a video in a video, but it's the classic of Stephen Krashen uh, showing his comprehensible input method of drawing a face while talking with you in German asking you to say ja, nein, that kind of thing, uh, and making it quite pleasant and playful. Um, oh no, don't play. Das ist meine Hand. Yeah, that was that one. Uh, the implications of CI, and I see I'm already on 18 minutes, There are qu these are quite important hypotheses, and Krashen's not the only researcher to be in the second language acquisition field. There are some really important later ones as well, but I'm just bringing him in because he's one of the most um, like fundamental type ones. Uh, there's the acquisition learning hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that posits that there's a difference between implicit and explicit knowledge. Your brain acquires language implicitly when the right conditions are met. But what you learn explicitly is really only useful for knowing about the language, facts about the language, and it does not really penetrate into your, uh, your heart of hearts as knowing the language. Then there's the monitor hypothesis, the idea that students can use their explicit knowledge to edit their language to look like they've learnt something, like look like they've acquired something, but this can only happen when they have time and know the rule. So this happens when students get something right on the grammar test and in the heat of the moment in the unseen they don't get it right like that happens all the time in my classes uh and there's also the input hypothesis to acquire a language you need to receive comprehensible input understandable messages in the target language that you care about the meaning of and um beside that there's also the effective filter hypothesis it posits that Stress and anxiety inhibits natural language acquisition, which makes a whole lot of sense. If you reckon that the brain is doing a lot of work in uh, gaining a second language, like it's doing a lot of unconscious work behind the scenes. Um, and I do find that that is the case. Like After listening to a lot of Italian, I feel tired. Uh, but obviously it takes resources for the brain to acquire a language. And sorry about the sound of rain here. There was no rain on the actual day. It was a beautiful day. It takes the brain resources to acquire a language, but in a fight or flight situation, it doesn't make sense to devote those mental resources towards a long-term goal, which is language acquisition. You should be, um, the brain should 
direct its resources towards escaping danger in those situations. So anything that puts you into fight or flight, stress, anxiety, uh, try to escape danger, life or death situation, is going to reduce your ability to um, use that time for language acquisition. So we should be mindful of that and try not to have stressful, anxiety-inducing situations in language classrooms, um, because language is not a matter of life or death. Uh, then there's the natural order hypothesis, one of the most interesting ones, um, one of the most interesting findings, uh, which posits that for every language, there is a fixed order in which structures will be acquired by learners, regardless of what their first language was, and regardless of the order it gets presented to them in the grammar curriculum. In the Latin space, this is really um, exemplified by the accusative case which is taught extremely early. It's taught in like chapter two. But in my experience and in the experience of pretty much every um, other teacher that I've seen online talking about it, um, the accusative case is really acquired quite late-ish, surprisingly late-ish. There was a US um, teacher, I think it was Bob Patrick, who said that his students were able to produce gerundives of purpose accurately before they were able to produce accusative cases accurately. So um, that goes to show that maybe the order that we teach something in an external grammar curriculum has no bearing on the order that the brain actually wants to acquire things by. Maybe the, the brain sees the accusative case as something that it should leave to later. It's like, um, I'll, I'll handle you later, you're not uh, the most important thing in this language. And I'll work out meaningful things like gerundives of purpose first. It's, it's wild. Other implications of comprehensible input are that the four modes of language are not equal. So the receptive modes of listening and reading provide comprehensible input. And so they drive language acquisition. Whereas the productive modes provide comprehensible input for the receiver, not for the creator. So in class, assigning English to Latin translations or isolated language composition tasks like um, for the sake of an exercise, write about your day in your diary or something, does not provide CI for that learner. What I do in class is I get students to write things in Latin for their student, their fellow students to read or hear. Um, I want them to read or hear each other's production. Uh, and I want to facilitate making it that way because, I mean, they love reading the crazy things that their fellow students write. Um, but basically, I want to utilize the productive modes to provide CI for the rest of the class and not for its own sake. Uh, why should we be advocating for spoken Latin at the end of the day? Who will learn more Latin? A student who spends 10 minutes processing 50 words in Latin because they're doing a translation task, or a student who spends 10 minutes processing 600 words in Latin because they're watching a video about Minecraft in Latin with continuous Latin dialogue. What I've been finding is that uh, part of the reason why we have this uh, like 12 times less Latin than we could have in, in the class situation, uh, students spending 10 minutes to translate around about 50 words in Latin into English, is that we're doing too much translation as an activity in class. Now, I'm not against translation as an assessment. I think that translation as an assessment is a pretty good metric, actually a really good metric um, for how reliable it is it, at capturing a lot of stuff at once. Um, but doing translation as an activity limits the amount of Latin that can be delivered in that class. Like, for one thing, there is a physical writing process of putting words down, in some subjects, slowing things down might be a good thing because then you can think about it a bit more. But in this case, the writing is happening in English, not in Latin. And the thinking is happening in English, not in Latin. It's being processed in English and not Latin, which is a problem. It means that you just can't deliver that much Latin. Uh, you can't deliver 12 times as much translation work to a student. You can't just say, do 12 times as much homework. But what we can do in our lessons is look at the activities that we're actually delivering in the time that we have and see, can I deliver word-rich, uh, language-rich activity versions of that that involve lots of full sentences forming coherent narratives? 
So I'm going to leave it here. It was 25 minutes. Yikes. And here's my bag of tricks. Uh, my bag of tricks thing will be the next video. Ami, ami, Esther, 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 Esther,